Welcome to SciShow Quiz Show, where real smart people duke it out in a scientific battle of wits. I'm Michael Aranda, your host, and our contestants today are Hank Green, mm -hmm. a local Montanan who's playing extreme weather bingo with the rest of us with an earthquake and lots of wildfires so far. Yeah, that well, was we're a gonna... really long intro. Do you, you want to do it again? Because you seemed confused the whole time. It just kept going. <laughs> it's fine. We'll just roll with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I you get that free space in the middle, and I'm just, I'm just. Crossing my fingers for some serious hail. Mm. Yeah, what about That's the Yellowstone not, explosion? We're not putting that on the list, buddy. That's uh, That's game over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't get to collect your $15. Okay, fair. So, Hank is competing against SciShow's entire New York satellite office, who's visiting just in time for our smoke, our senior editor, Alyssa Lerner. Hi, Alyssa. Hi. <laughs> As a special... Jeez, nobody clapped. Nobody said it. Just silence from behind the cameras. Mm. <laughs> Ah, ah. There you go. That made me less uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> As a special thank you to our supporters on Patreon, we've selected two of you at random to win some awesome prizes. Hank, you're playing for John Carruthers. Hello, John. Thank and you. Alyssa, you're playing for Lucy McGlasson. Hi, Lucy. Stefan, show our players and the audience what they can win. John and Lucy, welcome to the show. Both of you are going to be taking home some special prizes today. We've got the autographed cards from our final round, which will have the contestants' beautifully written final guesses and wagers on them. But the person who ends the show with the least amount of points today, today's loser, will take home the fabulous and rare I Lost SciShow Quiz Show pin. Good luck to the contestants. Let's play ball! Okay, you both start off with a thousand SciShow bucks. Each time you answer a question correctly, you'll win some. If you get it wrong, you'll lose some. Ready? Yes. Okay, our first round is about medicine. Specifically, some of the old, bad medicine. Did you write this one? No, of course not. <laughs> Sari wrote this okay. one. <laughs> All right, let's make it sure. <laughs> so, when doctors were first tinkering around with blood transfusions, they tried out some non-blood substitutes. Ooh. In 1854, some doctors were trying to treat cholera and used a liquid that they thought our bodies could change into white blood cells. They hoped it would boost blood volume and the immune system so people could fight off the bacterial infection. Unfortunately, this artificial blood didn't actually do this or really help in any way at all. What was the substance? Coconut water? <laughs> milk? I was hoping that wouldn't be one of the choices. You thought milk? I, I went way worse. I, I was like, oh, you know, the pus from cow boils. Oh, we still have two more choices. <laughs> Semen. Uh, oh no. I mean, that makes a certain amount of sense. Or egg whites. Oh, you're going. Egg whites. Unfortunately, that oh, is incorrect. That's a red color. I'm gonna go with semen. That is also incorrect. That's too Thank bad. God. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey. The answer is milk. Okay. Oh, man. I thought that would be like a red herring because it's white. Yeah. Also semen. Yeah. White herring. A white herring. People did not understand what cells were. Mm -mm. But they did. They. They thought it would convert into white blood cells, so they must have known something about cells. Right. They like look and they're like, oh, there's little droplets in here. Just like the lipid droplets would just become white blood it's cells. It's just yeah. blood milk. Milk, it does come out of an animal. I guess. And there's a lot of it around. How did that go? You're going to tell us right I'm now. I'm about Mark. to tell you. Right now. <laughs> the answer is B. Milk. During the cholera epidemic in 1854, two doctors in Toronto milked a cow through gauze into a warm bowl. Then they injected 355 milliliters of this milk into the bloodstream of a sick 40-year-old man. They thought the fatty globules in the milk could be converted into white blood cells, which would eventually become red blood cells. This was probably because of another scientist's experiments with milk and animal blood. Because two patients recovered after their milk transfusions, these doctors thought it was a good blood replacement, even though five others died. And then in 1873, the treatment was used again by a doctor in New York City. He performed goat milk transfusions on tuberculosis patients and dogs with not so great results, but assumed any deaths were from too much milk, not the milk itself. Over the next few years, a couple more doctors in North America and England bought into the dairy hype and experimented with cow, goat, and even human milk transfusions. But eventually, skepticism and reports of bad side effects were enough to force this bad blood substitute to drop out of fashion. The psychoanalyst Wilhelm Reich had a controversial career in the early 1900s, and many of his ideas are considered to be pseudoscience nowadays. Take the concept of orgone a physical energy that supposedly permeates the universe. Hmm. He argued that 
orgone contributes to things like the sky's blue color or the blue of a certain frog during mating season, along with galaxy formation, chlorophyll weather, and human emotions. Reich even created big boxes for people to sit in called orgone accumulators, which he claimed would harness the energy and treat illnesses like cancer. And how much money did he charge people to sit in the boxes? You know, not nothing. <laughs> Too fitty. <laughs> the idea of orgone was built off another idea, though. What was it? Freud's idea of libido as sexual energy, Mesmer's idea of animal magnetism, Bergson's idea of elan vital, which he used to explain growth and evolution, or Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. I was gonna, I was gonna say Jung before I even heard all of that, so I'm gonna go with Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. Mm. I'm correct, I'm afraid. So I. I'm just trying to get to zero this round. This time, I just feel like it's like golf. Lower scores are better. Mm -hmm. Elon Vital. Unfortunately, that is also incorrect. All right, good. Good job. Good Woo! job. That saves me from, you know, <laughs> not being tied with you. So we continue yeah. to be tied just lower down than we once were. I need to stop guessing based on what I think Sari would have made the choices. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is A, libido. Wilhelm Reich was a former student of Freud and took his theory of the libido a step beyond sexy stuff with orgone energy, which he said flows through the universe like some kind of cosmic life force. The term came from words like orgasm and organism, and he believed that when you didn't have enough of this energy or bottled it up, you got sick. So to fix that, he created orgone accumulator boxes that supposedly concentrated the energy and could heal people. These ideas were mostly based on speculation, misconceptions, and some sometimes questionable experiments, not rigorous empirical evidence. So now they're considered pseudoscience. Point blank, just sitting in a big box isn't going to cure cancer. On to round two, which we're gonna call, hopefully we'll go better than round one, <laughs> space time. The Van Allen belts sure. are two clouds of high energy particles surrounding the Earth held in place by its magnetic field. We've known about them since the launch of the Explorer 1 satellite in 1958, and have learned a lot since then, like how they can change size because of what the sun's spewing out at any given moment. But this year, researchers found that the inner boundary of the Van Allen belts is definitely farther away from the Earth than it was in the 1960s. Hmm. And they think it's because of something we're doing. Is it cluttering low Earth orbit with more satellites and space debris, releasing dust clouds in the upper atmosphere for research, heating up the ionosphere with high-frequency radio waves to study it, or producing more very low-frequency radio communications. Yeah, you go first. Okay. The first one. Incorrect! Hey, wow. I just, man, we can't, but I guess I have to go too. I'm gonna say D. More very low frequency. Yay! That is correct. Yay! We're pushing it Congrats, out. With our... Is that the first correct answer? It is. Yeah. The first, yes. Yay! I don't, we've never done that bad. <laughs> Woo! I blame Sari. <laughs> yeah, well, Let's get her down here. <laughs> yeah. Defend yourself. The answer is D very low frequency communications. A lot of us will never use very low frequency or VLF radio waves, which range between 3 and 30 kilohertz. They can't transmit audio like voices, but scientists in the military use them for things like broadcasting coded messages or time signals across long distances to submarines deep below the ocean's surface. We've been using VLF more in the past few decades than in the 1960s, and it turns out that these radio waves are also flying into space and interacting with charged particles in the Van Allen belts to change how and where they move. So basically, there's a VLF bubble surrounding the Earth and pushing back these high-energy belts. We are accidentally changing space weather with our communications way down here. In the past few years, Two teams of researchers managed to create a brand new material called a time crystal, which sounds like some kind of fake magical That's relic, something. but it's real. Crystals have a regular atomic structure, like how a diamond is made of precisely ordered carbon atoms. To make a time crystal, one team used a chain of 10 ytterbium ions. The researchers hit them a few times with two lasers, one that made an effective magnetic field, and one that flipped the spins of the atoms. Another team used diamonds to create their time crystal with densely packed tiny defects called called nitrogen vacancy centers, where a carbon atom is replaced with a nitrogen atom. So, knowing that, can you guess what makes a time crystal special? Is it that it breaks into its component atoms all at once, has a constantly changing structure that repeats in cycles, vibrates faster and faster and emits a lot of energy, or freezes nearby atoms in place? And the atoms are just like, I'm absolute zero now. That doesn't sound right. I'm sorry, I gave you a hint. I'm gonna go first, because <laughs> okay. you went first last time. And I'm gonna say that it's the thing that is the second thing where they, what was it? What's the second thing again? Has a constantly changing structure that repeats in cycles. That one. That is correct. Yeah. 
That would have been my guess too. Dang it, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I wanted to let you go first so that you could eliminate more choices. <laughs> <laughs> A viable strategy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is what I've been letting Alyssa do. <laughs> it's worked well for you so far. Well, I mean, not that well. <laughs> I'm still doing quite poorly. The answer is B. Time crystals have a constantly changing structure that repeats. Crystals are defined as having an orderly repeating structure in space. So time crystals are defined as having an orderly repeating structure in time. The idea of a time crystal was first proposed by a theoretical physicist in 2012, and there was a lot of skepticism surrounding it. But after years of work, physicists were able to come up with a theoretical recipe for time crystals, and then two teams of researchers made them a reality. Time crystals are stable, but they aren't in a still equilibrium like a ruby would be. Instead, time crystals are what these researchers are calling non equilibrium matter, because the atoms settle into a repetitive, moving pattern of slightly changing spins. It's not a perpetual motion machine, by the way, because the crystals need to be blasted by the lasers occasionally to keep them moving. But it's still a brain-bending example of theory-turned-reality, and physicists are excited to explore more non-equilibrium materials that could exist. Theoretically, a time crystal could be used as memory storage in a quantum computer. Okay, the next question is all about animal bodies. Sometimes they work real differently than ours do. For instance, male narwhals have a huge tooth sticking out of their heads, making them basically aquatic unicorns. And biologists have had a lot of different hypotheses about what they use these tusks for, like detecting subtle changes in the water with super-sensitive nerve endings or chipping away at the ice. But in May this year, a swimming narwhal was caught on drone video making jagged up-and-down movements with its tusk, a behavior that had never been seen before. What do scientists think it was doing? Making vibrations to talk to other narwhals, clubbing fish to stun them, acting aggressive to scare the drone away, or flinching because fish were tickling it. <laughs> Got that fish tickle. That's my guess, is the you fish tickle. You fish tickle? Yeah. I'm sorry, Aww. that is incorrect. That's, I'm gonna go with fish stunning. That is correct. Oh man, Alyssa. Woo. Whacking those little fish. Bow, 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 with my head tooth. I just feel like that's something we would have known already. Narwhals, they're not easy to observe. Yeah, they're out in the middle of nowhere. It's cold. Nobody wants they're to be up there. Suspicious, mysterious animals. But they don't mind drones. Mm, yeah, they're fine with drones. Yeah, they're not aggressive. I feel them. like you, if you got a tooth sticking out of your head, there should be multiple reasons why you have it. It shouldn't be like one thing. You can have like a super sensitive organ that also is a fish club. <laughs> yeah. That would be pretty painful if it me. was really sensitive. Well, but maybe it's sensitive just like to electromagnetism. Or other unicorns, like the ones on land. Like yeah, it's, a, it's like a unicorn oh, dowsing it's rod. Their, their antenna to communicate with radio waves, but only with other unicorn animals. And that makes the Van Allen belts move. We got it. We solved the science. (laughs) (laughs) The answer is B, clubbing their prey. This drone video showed a narwhal using its tusk to hit and stun an arctic cod and then sucking it up as a snack. This is the first time scientists have actually seen narwhals using their tooth as a weapon. That's not to say other hypotheses are bunk. It's possible that narwhals use their tusks for other things too, like really important sensory organs or for sexual selection. We just have to keep studying them to find out. Arthropods, which includes your arachnids, crustaceans, and insects, have open circulatory systems instead of closed ones like us. All of their organs are floating in a fluid called hemolymph, which isn't contained in blood vessels. Hemolymph acts kind of like our blood, though, and lots of arthropods have hearts to help pump it around and get oxygen to their tissues. Sea spiders have really small abdomens that make it hard for their organs to fit inside, and long, spindly legs. They have tiny hearts, which aren't enough to pump hemolymph around their whole bodies. So they have another way of getting oxygen to all of their tissues. What's the animal again? The uh, sea spider. Mm, I haven't heard of this. Are they actually spiders? No, they're almost certainly crustaceans. Can't imagine that there are aquatic spiders that I don't know about. Okay. Do they tumble to move, retract their legs, which are made of a stretchy material, have long branching guts that contract, or have muscles lining each of their legs? Moving the hemolymph around. When I was in college, I did research on crabs, uh, and we would remove the hemolymph from them with little needles, just like hit them in the elbow and just suck it out and some blue stuff and then do tests on it after running them on treadmills. So I'm gonna say one of the answers that you said, four. Have muscles lining each of their legs? Yeah. Incorrect, I'm afraid. I'm gonna go with contracting their legs. Incorrect! (sighs) They have long branching guts that contract. Huh. At some point, I will get a question right. There's at least one more question. The answer is C. 
pump their guts. A sea spider, or pygnogonid, doesn't have enough space in its abdomen to hold all its guts. So its digestive system branches out all over its body and down every leg, kind of like how our blood vessels branch out everywhere. And instead of having gills, sea spiders take in oxygen by diffusion through their exoskeleton. Researchers noticed that the rhythmic peristalsis of a sea spider's gut, which is basically the muscles contracting and relaxing to move food along, is much stronger than they expected. Its heart, on the other hand, pumps pretty weakly. After some experiments on 12 species of sea spiders, scientists learned that as food gets pushed down their legs, oxygen-rich hemolymph gets squeezed around their bodies. So the weight of their heart really is their stomach. Or at least that's what keeps the hemolymph pumping. And now for the final question, <laughs> the script says. <laughs> yeah. So Alyssa, you have 500 points. Mm -hmm. Hank, you have 1,300 points. You can wager any, all, or none of those points on your answer to the next question, which follows uh, the same basic theme as our previous questions. Watery animal type things. Those are good. They're so yeah. weird. They okay. are so weird. So we're going to cut to commercial break, maybe. Welcome back. One species of water boatman is a teeny tiny two millimeter freshwater insect that can make an incredibly loud noise. In 2011, researchers recorded this sound with an underwater microphone from one meter away mm. and found it was an average of 78.9 decibels with a max of 99.2 decibels. In air, that would be like standing next to a jackhammer or a power lawnmower. And while they're muffled underwater, you can still hear them from a nearby riverbank. Only the males can make this sound, and researchers think it helps them to woo a mate. Sure. So how do they do it? Stabbing another male with their penis. What? Why would that make noise? Is he just like, ow, dude? It's just, it's just really, it's like they're, they're in their language, it's just like, dude! I really explain lies. why the scream it's, is so loud. It's yeah. the same as, you know, stabbing a, a sidewalk with a jackhammer that makes noise. <laughs> They have powerful penises. Or do they do it by sucking up air and farting? Or I'm gonna rule it out. Pumping water out their butt so they speed along and rub against sand. What? Or rubbing their penis against their abdomen. So it's definitely a butt or a penis thing. It isn't any of those, Michael. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know, man. I didn't invent this insect, so that's real good. Whoever did, mm. A plus. Good job on this one, A plus. nature. All right, I got my answer. Okay. I don't really know how to write it down. Reveal your answers. What, what does that even mean? Penis ab popping. They rub their penis against their abs. Okay. Pumping water. Hank is correct. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's like smacking it against their bellies. You know, it makes a loud what noise. What kind of dicks? Let me tell you about it right now. <laughs> the answer is D, rubbing their penis against their abdomen. A lot of insects make sounds by stridulation, or rubbing different parts of their bodies together. Grasshoppers use appendages on their hind legs and wings, while crickets just use their wings. And this water boatman uses its abdomen and a ridge on its paramere, which is what entomologists call part of an insect penis. The rubbing area is only around 50 micrometers across, which is about as wide as a human hair, so the researchers aren't sure how they amplify the noise so much. They think the loudness happened through something called runaway selection, because the lady water boatmen seem to mate with the best and loudest singers, and they don't have any predators that hunt them down using sound. But you know, we should probably leave the penis orchestrations to the insects and find our mates with other kinds of communication, like talking. I what? got zero! I got zero. John, I got you, I got you a reward. Lucy, I'm very sorry, but I also got your reward, technically. You're not the only person who's gotten zero on the show. In fact, you're not the only person at this table who's gotten a zero on the show. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, thanks for joining us on this SciShow Quiz Show, and thanks to all of our patrons on Patreon. If you want to hear more from Hank and Alyssa together, you can check out a couple episodes on our podcast, Holy Fracking Science, yeah. we'll say, to be, you know, sure. HFS. HFS. And don't forget, of course, to go to youtube.com slash scishow and subscribe. 